welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have as my guest today, Gregory El Sasser Chavez. Gregory, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. All right. So Gregory is a gay Christian man who was divorced from his ex-wife in 2019 and subsequently lost his kids. Before that, he had gone through 15 years of aversion and reparative, quote, ex-gay therapy, such as sniffing dog feces, uh, quote, defeating issues of masculinity by playing sports with other gay men, completing ex-gay courses and being placed into two mental hospitals. Now Gregory talks to people about coming out later in life and dealing with the trauma of religious reparative therapy and the entire ex-gay movement. Gregory, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, before we get into that, which sounds crazy, I mean, and I don't mean to diminish the intensity of that, but before we get into that, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Yeah, I, I grew up in Southern California in a small suburb of Los Angeles. I actually still live in the same city that I was born. I, I've lived here probably my entire 51 years with the exception of a year or two different places. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, let's get into this. I mean, that the bio I read that 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 paragraph. I mean, it just sounds. What, what, what do you call that? You I mean, know, it's funny because it does sound crazy <laughs> to me now as you read it. I'm like, that's crazy. When I was in the middle of it, it sounded totally rational, totally, completely rational. And now I just have the time and experience to look back and go, that was not rational. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. How how did all this unfold? Well, I I kind of you know I was born I was raised Christian in a free Methodist church, and then eventually when I was eighteen went to a Calvary Chapel for almost thirty years. Um, I you know in my story is this very similar with other gay men. It's like I didn't know I was gay. I just knew something was different when I was probably about eight years old and. You just didn't, didn't have a name for it at eight. And when I started getting into middle school and high school, I knew that I was attracted to people of the same sex, but you never thought about it. You never thought I am attracted to men. You just knew there was that there was you were drawn to it and then you stopped thinking about it. So I did that for for many, many years. I, I dated girls, went out with girls. Um and it wasn't until college that I could, at least in my brain, say, OK, I struggle with same sex, same sex attraction. I never said I was gay. I said I, mm -hmm. I struggle with it. And as a Christian, we were, you know, we struggle with lots of sin. Right. So that's what I just said. And I went to many therapists. All said and done, as of today, from start to finish, I've been to about 32 I think that was the final wow. number. And that includes some pastors, but most, about a good 60 or 70% are were therapists. Um, and, so, and let me hold on a second. So, you began to see a therapist. Why? Well, before I would acknowledge what the problem it was just depression. Okay. And it was, you know, I don't get along with my dad. So, but mostly depression. I had tried to commit suicide for the first time when I was 15. I, I look back on it now and go, it was because I was struggling with my sexuality before I would admit it. Mm -hmm. But that was really the reason. And then I tried again at uh, 21, wow. but I knew more of the reason at 21. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's primarily why I went to therapist for depression. By the time I was in college, I was ready to admit that I was struggling. And so um, I would go into I would only go to Christian therapists and I would go to them and say, I want to get rid of this. And this was mm -hmm. the early 90s. And the big 
you know, there's a big movement through the huge ministry called Exodus International. They were just humongous. And um, they would they said, you can change. You can change your sexual orientation. It can be switched. And so the Christian church, because Exodus was a Christian ministry, also went along with that and said, hey, it's a sin that can be changed. And I firmly believe that I started reading tons of books. Uh, my first one was one from a gal named Leanne Payne. And I, I remember specifically to get rid of homosexuality, to anoint my head with oil as I prayed over it. So I remember dropping oil on my head and on my forehead and praying over it. And, you know, all it did was give me acne. Um, it didn't do anything to change my sexuality. Mm. Um but it was about 22 when I finally went to the therapist who told me about aversion therapy. She was a Christian and she explained what it was. She said, basically, you've got to make yourself repulsed by these feelings for men. And so she asked me um, if I found any women that were attractive. And I named two. I remember to this day, I, the thing is so traumatic. I remember everything. It was Kirsty Alley and, um, Oh, shoot. now I forgot her name. Who is who's the gal? Um, blonde hair and her father was Wally George. I don't know. And I, Rebecca De Mornay. So I okay. took get pictures of them and go and get pictures of men you find attractive. And so I went and tore out all the cologne magazine uh, ads of uh, men. And she wanted me to every day uh, lust and what comes with lusting over the pictures of the women and look at them while I was lusting. But then she said, for the men part, I want you to find some feces. Wow. And I remember going like my own. <laughs> She's like, I should never forget. She goes, well, that might be too personal. <laughs> She's concerned that I might use my own feces might be a problem. Um, she said, maybe some dog feces, some animal feces. So I was living with my buddy and his family at the time. And so at night when no one, everybody was asleep, I went and got, they had a mason jar and I got this mason jar and I went in the backyard and that dog was so old. I remember the poop was even gray. Mm -hmm. And I, I put the, the poop in the mason jar. And then every day for a while, I would look at the pictures of the men and I would lust over them. And you know what comes with that. And I would sniff the dog poop while I did it. And the point was, was to make myself vomit. I could never get myself to vomit, but I would just retch and I would be extremely nauseous. And I was supposed to do that once or twice a day, as many times as I was to do with the women. And I got to the point too, where I was in full-time school. So I didn't always have time at home. So I would take you with me to school in a backpack mm -hmm. and I would go out to my car during break. And all I would do at that point, because I was in public, was just look at the pictures of the men and sniff it and make myself. Wow. It wasn't working, obviously. And I was so afraid I was getting caught. I was living with a family of like four people. I was afraid they would just barge into my room and there I am sniffing their dog's poop. Right. Um, so yeah, let, so, me, let me, mm -hmm. if I may. So up to this point, during this point, had you been uh, dating women? Uh, yes, I was dating women all the way through college and high school. I didn't get married until I was 24. Okay. Yes. And were, did you have any gay friends? Uh, no, I, I was very Christian and we okay, so did you not have gay friends. Okay. Wow. I mean, I'm mean, sure I did, but not that right. I do. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so go on. Okay. So once I gave that up and I gave up that therapist, I, I always played a, I always switched therapists anyway, after a couple months when things wouldn't work, they could not fix me. And no matter what kind of counseling, I would go to another one. Then I started reparative therapy, which was really in all of the books, the, the Christian ex gay books that was popular is um, you figure out why you were gay, because it's not biological, it is completely environmental, according to the books. And it was generally because you had an emotionally distant or emotionally abusive father or a um a very dominant mother that's that's that was the argument and for for girls for lesbians it was the same thing you had an overly abusive mother passive you know father so i i believed that i mean my me and my dad had not really gotten along we'd always 
butted heads. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, this totally makes sense. So all I have to do, and I just would go through courses and books and studying about how to forgive my dad and go through scriptures. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen the film Boy Erased, it was very similar to that, with the exception of I didn't go to a camp. And I wasn't beaten with the Bible like some of those kids were. Uh, there has been abuse. There has been people who are beaten, electric shock, uh, tons of different things. Uh, I didn't have to go through anything that severe. So mm. for years and years, I read books and I went to conferences. And, you know, it was interesting because everything was about, well, it's your dad. It's your dad. You've got to forgive him. And my parents really didn't want me to be gay. They were Christian, too. And so they were very supportive of me doing these things. But then when I told my dad, hey, basically, this is your fault, <laughs> he did not like that. And, you know, said, "Don't. I, it's not my fault. Don't blame me. But yet at the same time, that was the Christian that was the Christian thought that that's why you were gay or lesbian was because of relationship with your parents. So I did that. I mean, I really did that on and off my entire marriage. I, I think I, the last book I read was, I was like 46. Wow. Yeah. And so I all to, during this yeah. time, you, you, you were trying to get rid of this. You, yes. you did, did you ever say to yourself, I'm gay? Never. Never. Okay. How did that come about for you? Yeah. Well, um, by the time I, I had, well, all right, let me start. I got married to a woman and she was a very good friend and I loved her to death. And I just, I mean, it's just, Christianity doesn't give you options. You, you aren't going to be gay. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll marry her. Uh, and I loved her very much. And so we got married and, um, and we struggled. We we just struggled in our marriage. But then we had our kids. And when I had my first kid, I was in love so much for the very first time in my life with my child. Mm. I didn't care if I was gay or straight. I didn't care about sex, nothing. I poured my entire life into that child. And um, he was my world. And then we had a second. And then eventually we had a third. So during those years, it just really didn't cross my mind. I didn't care. Then the boys got older and they didn't need dad as much and they didn't want dad around as much. You know, I would beg them to let me hang out with them. And then I, uh, you know, like they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That's when I was getting bored um, and um, restless. And I had a lot of extra time and I started to think about you know, my sexuality a lot more, my identity. And so I picked up the books again and the books were like, you got to hang out with masculine guys who are straight and let them affirm you and tell you at a boy, you're a good guy and you did great hitting that ball. And, <laughs> and that would eventually work. I remember one group therapy I went with was a bunch of gay guys. And so he said, you know what, you need to play basketball together so that you guys can affirm each other. And that will help. And I mean, if you have never seen 10 gay guys play basketball, <laughs> you are missing out. <laughs> Holy cow. That was a disaster. How, how long ago was this? <laughs> The, the basketball was in, it was after I was married. I was probably 28, 29. Okay. And it, it was a secret men's group for, at a church. And man, it was depressing. Mm. Gosh, everybody was depressed because nobody could, we mm. couldn't love. We were not allowed to love. And we, and we were told that we were going to hell and mm. that this was awful. And you just, you were depressed all the time. So fast forward back now, the kids got older. I was, you know, 46 and I, I was hitting, I was heading seriously. Um, to rock bottom. I uh, so I read the book about masculinity and I I always had worked out, but I got into working out. I did a triathlon with a straight guy. I <laughs> thought that would help. And uh, I started taking some supplements that made me really, really huge. And I thought that'll make me more masculine. I bought myself a Jeep, not knowing that Jeeps are like <laughs> the gay car of of all gay men i didn't know that oh that's true big tires on it to make it you know masculine and tall and i got tattooed and nothing nothing was doing it and i was getting more and more depressed and more and more desperate and i started playing with fire a little bit on the internet and so i went to a therapist and he was a christian i went back to therapy and he said what do you think about asking your wife if you could step out once in a while get it out of your system and then be a good husband. And I was like, you're not a Christian. I'm not coming back here. And so I did it. Went to another Christian therapist within the first there session. He said, 
listen, I, you can come here, so, but I can't help you not be gay. No one ever can help you. You're going to be gay. And I went, oh, this is a Christian. And I went, okay, I think I'll stay. And so Whoa. I started staying with him. And after a couple, a month, he said, listen, this is the road you're heading. You can either be your kids can either have a gay dad or they can have a dead dad because that's where you're heading. Wow. And he said, what do you want to do? And I did have to think about it for a while. I've been, I had been suicidal all my life. Not like I'm going to commit suicide, but just thinking about death my mm -hmm. entire life and, and looking forward to it. Wow. And I said, I, I think I, I want my kids. I don't want to be dead. I, I, I'll, I choose gay dad. So he helped me. And then I had moved out of my house in early 2019. And it was, that, this is just a couple of years ago. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. And, you know, I we didn't tell the boys immediately why. And my eldest, he was like 16 at the time. And he was in my class. I'm a high school English teacher. And he was in my class at the time. And he called me, said, when are you coming home? I don't get it. So I, I went home and I, I explained it to them and they were quiet and they didn't like it, but they weren't not not speaking to me. Both my oldest two had were going to the school that I was teaching at and they would, you know, we used to go to lunch and, and they would come by my room and visit me. Um, but then when word got out on campus, mm. uh, the, the English teacher was gay, left his family. Those boys were humiliated and I am oh, really completely understand here i am standing in front of the class that my son is in and we're talking about great guy we're talking about the great gats speaking of tom is cheating on his wife and he's such a horrible husband and blah 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 and my son is just sitting there quietly wow. taking notes it was surreal um but i i hung on to them and then slowly my middle one stopped talking to me and the next thing you know he didn't speak to me and that's been three and a half years Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Um, my eldest son would go back and forth. He was trying so hard. He was trying so hard. And then my middle one, I had, by the time we had divorced, I had custody uh, too of him, but he even got to a point. They were under a lot of pressure to not see me. Um, there was talk about what if someone you're that I dated might molest you, um, and so eventually they all started pulling away and I haven't seen my youngest for two years and I haven't seen my oldest who, like I said, really tried for a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. So were, that was, they, that was as devastating as, you know, holding in my sexuality for so many years. I, I bet. W w was this because they were brought up Christian? Yes. Like and Christian? I did bring them up Christian. Al although in my defense, I always stuck up for, for gay people when my kids were little. I'm like, I don't care. You have a friend who's gay. You love them. You do not treat them any different, even if you disagree. And I was very adamant on that. So they shouldn't have hated me because of that. And because we were so close and tight growing up, I, there was no abuse. There was love. I mean, we had rough moments when they were teenagers, of course, but I just was... There was just a lot of pressure from the outside to not have a relationship with me mm. and uh, and they're gone. You know, people say, oh, they'll come back <laughs> to you when they're 40. <laughs> like, well, that, that's a long time. Gregory, that, that is heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, this whole story, your story is, um, what's the word for this? I... Tragedy. I mean, if you're going to look at what the Greeks called tragedy, it's tragic. It's, you know, it's the downfall of a man. And in a way, it was the downfall of losing my kids. However, to be positive, my brain for the first time was just so relaxed for the first time since I was a little kid because I didn't have to hide it anymore. You, you don't know that the effort that you go through to fake it and hide it so nobody knows what you are thinking and faking liking girls and watching your mannerisms and watching what you listen to, what you watch on TV, how you dress, how you move. It's just constant. And when I finally said I am gay and it didn't hate myself for it, oh my goodness, it was like, a, to use the cliche, a weight had been lifted. No. And I could relax and I had no problem telling anybody. I never hit it again. And I wasn't ashamed to tell people. Um, but I just traded one.
trauma for another and losing my kids and Mm -hmm. You know, and I, you know, to my kids' credit, too, I went and started dating immediately. I was like, I have waited too long and I went a little crazy. I was acting kind of like a teenager. And I'm, and I, they found out, um, mm-hmm. um, two ways I did not plan on them to find out, but they did. And I'm sure that was hard on them, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I get it. I get their anger and their frustration. However, it's been four years and I keep going, hey, I think it's time to forgive your dad. <laughs> but and also good is I, I started dating someone in October of that same year. We took it real slow at first. Um, his name is Abraham. And we started dating and then COVID hit and we moved in together uh, for a good reason of, of COVID and financial reasons, too. And we were in love. And then a year later, we were married. And he is a very good guy. And the most attractive thing about him is he was very nice to my children when I had them. He had met mm-hmm. two of them. And he was a very good guy to my kids. And he's been good to me. And he has sat through my grief and held on and just said, I know who you are. You're a good man. I'm going to gonna ride this storm out with you. Um, and so there's there's happiness, too. There's happiness and joy through all of it. How did you get to the point where you, you wanted or maybe even needed to, to share your story? Immediately, uh, especially the more I lost my kids, I said, OK, there has to be some good that comes out of this. There has mm-hmm. to be because if, it, if I die and it was, well, mm-hmm. what happened through all this was you got to be gay. And that was it. That just so self-centered. And I didn't want to be self-centered. So, um, you know, I started writing my son. I, I've never stopped contacting my kids. I write them letters. I send them gifts all the time. Um, no response. But I started writing my middle son since he was the first one to cut me off letters to him. And next thing you know, they were, it was 100,000 words. So I sent them to him and I never heard back. So... I started contacting some publishers, got a publisher almost right away oh my and it changed everybody's names. So it would be my kids wouldn't have to, you know, there's their names are not mentioned. The city we're living in, nothing is mentioned and um, got a publisher and the book will be published in the spring. Wow. And it, it's <laughs> a guide. It's a guide. It is letters to my son. A, a good portion of them are this is what you need to be a man. This is what I'm not there to give you advice that does not get me out of my responsibility to raise you. So I'm going to raise you through these letters. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also our family story and trying to at least explain, if not justify what I did. Um, I kept the focus on him and his brothers and how much how what they are like and how much I love them and trying not to make it about about me. Um, but it's going to help other people. There are men and women in my situation and it's becoming more and more prevalent as it, homosexuality becomes more accepted. People are leaving marriages that were not real from the beginning and um, and are going, what do I do now? I'm 50 years old. I'm 60. I'm, I'm coming. Uh, what do I do? And I'm hoping that it helps men uh, and women and and what not to do with their kids when they come out and don't make the same mistakes I did. Mm-hmm. And there's a great focus on that you can be a Christian and be gay. Because mm-hmm. the fear for most gay people that they are going to go to hell is what they've been told is traumatic in and of itself. And mm-hmm. I have been doing the studying and I want to assure people that you can be a Christian and you can be gay. And so I got to contribute. I mean, obviously, I'm not asking you to give us a whole synopsis of, of the book, but what is in those letters? Well, a lot of family anecdotes, um, but also how special he is, because, again, I want to keep the focus on him and what and memories of him. But then also trying to explain to him that I am the same dad, if not a better dad, because he grew up with a dad who was great and we were close. But I was there was always a fog of depression. Right. And, um, you know, um in the last year after I moved out, I was I got convinced to to move back in and I moved in for one night and it did not go well. Um, uh, and I went into the bedroom and I took a serious overdose 
with my children in the home. Another reason why they're frustrated. And uh, the next morning I was like a zombie. I was falling down and uh, my ex-wife uh, went to work and I was home alone with two children who were forced to take care of their dad as as the ambulance was coming. And uh, it's something I'll regret forever. Um, and I, I so I and they put me in a mental hospital. So I, I, to, I talked to my my son about the mental hospital and both of them. And I apologize for what I did and explained. But then I would shift to explain that I'm the same dad and you can be a Christian and be gay. And so it's a self-help. It's a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. There's fun, lots of funny parts. And it's not seriously melodramatic and depressing. Um, it's, so there's just a lot of fun in it, too. But there's a lot of hoping that he will read it and say, I love my dad. Mm. He's the same dad. I want to I want to come back. In, in my dad's life. So you said you sent them letters. Are you allowed to contact them like via phone or text or anything like that? Well, uh, my youngest, I don't even have his number. Um, I don't, I have no idea how to get a hold of him. Um, uh, my, my, my oldest two have phones, but they don't answer my texts. I, mm -hmm. I think they blocked me at this point. So I just write them letters and mail them to the house. I don't know if they get them for sure or not, but I do mail them. I think they get some of them. I also have pizza delivered. I have pizza delivers or just junk food delivered. Um, to their homes? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or I'll go at four in the morning, like on special graduation dates, and I'll like nail in balloons and oh. signs or whatever. Um I, I, my youngest, I get his school pictures. I'll just call up the school and um, get his school pictures. Um, the hard part, too, is they also cut off my parents. Uh, my parents are very Christian and they were not supportive at first. But then eventually they got to the point where they were like, we love our son. We will let God deal with him. Mm -hmm. And the moment that they accepted me, uh, there was pressure on my boys to cut them out and you know, my mother is 75 years old. My father is 80. They may not live to see my children again. And they just grieve every day without my kids. Yeah. Where do you find your strength in all this? Because as I'm listening, I, 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 I mean, it is, it sounds tragic and it sounds really sad, you know, and you said there, you know, there's a lot of humor in the story, in the book and so forth. Um, but for, for me, I mean, I look at you and you, you've got to be a really strong person, I believe, to go through what you did. And it's funny because I don't feel like a strong person because I was thinking about death for so many years. And every once in a while, it pops into my mind, uh, you know, not to do it, but just the, the obsession with thinking about, oh, how much better it's going to be. You know, one thing about the Christian belief is we believe that there's a better thing coming for us. And so I keep going, well, if there's a better place for me after I'm dead and this life sucks because it sucked when I was gay and I couldn't come out and then it sucked after I came out for a little bit. Um, why wouldn't I want to go there? Sure. It's just straight on go. I don't believe that, you know, if you commit suicide, you're going to hell or anything. So I'll tell you where my strength comes from. The strength comes from. Uh, my husband, number one, I, I don't think I would have made it if I'd have been doing this alone. Mm. And it has been hard on him. And there has been times where he's been honest and will say, I don't know how much more I can do with this grief thing. <laughs> and um, but he's such a great guy. And, and I'm, I'm just it's so compartmentalized. I have there's two sides of me. I have the grieving side and then I have the side that is just enjoying my husband and enjoying what being in love is like and sacrificing for him. Um, but he has walked me through and held me and talked to me. And so then my friends, the, the ones I kept, I lost a lot of friends. I was involved in a very big evangelical ministry and it's worldwide and I lost all of those guys mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some family members, but the one, the friends that stuck around, interestingly enough, the friends who stuck around 
none of them are Christians. Hmm. I just find that very um, ironic. Gosh, even if I would not have been gay and I was super Christian and if I, my friend came out with gay, that would never, ever, ever change me from hanging out with them or being the same person. But many of the gay uh, Christian community believes that if you're living that kind of lifestyle, um, you we, we can't we can't be with you. We can't be your friend unless it's your anathema. You were so. Yeah. So the friends, um, family, the ones that stuck around and and uh, my husband and, I, and I'm enjoying this life. I, I'm enjoying getting to be who I am and not hiding it and being in love. You don't understand to be in love for the first time at 47 years old. I was like a teenager man. Mm -hmm. and going through all of that. It was it was exciting. And I'm finally living the life that I really, really wanted to without my kids. But everything else is in place. Yeah. So there is joy and there is strength and I can keep going. So and there's wow. hope. There's hope that one day, one day, even if I'm 80 years old, one of my kids will say, all right, I, I want you in my life. Right. Right. Wow. Gregory, man. Uh, intense intense what do you what do you want people to hear what do you want people to know who are listening to this well, please let me help you please don't get into despair and end your life i know that almost is a cliche where they say oh there's so many things to live for but and, and suicide's not the answer but it is true suicide is not the answer uh, there are people who will help you i am one i i uh, I help anybody. Um, there are organizations that will help people. I, I just don't want people to think that God has abandoned them because they are gay or lesbian or trans or that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says to be a saved, to be a Christian, you, you're, you love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself, put your faith and trust in him. That's it. There are, there are no other conditions. Um, so I, I do want to help people. I desperately really want to be involved. I, I would love to start maybe once the book gets out, maybe start speaking in churches who are open, mm -hmm. open to the idea and maybe just travel around the country and visit churches and, and talk to them because there are many churches on the cusp. Now the church we go to is a straight church. It's not a gay church. It it's, but it has a gay community because they decided to be affirming. And so I would like to go to churches who are on the, the border line of being affirming and, and speak to them. And yeah. When, when does the book come out? Well, there is a really unedited version on Kindle right now. My publisher said I was allowed to keep it on Kindle until they released it. So they are looking at April. Oh, well, okay. But the book is on Kindle right now. In um, What's the name of the book? Terms of Estrangement. <laughs> okay. Terms of Estrangement. And then um, if people want to <clears throat> get the hard copy, they can wait until spring. Awesome. Well, look, I really appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story and being as open as you are. And uh, uh, I admire what you're doing. I'd love to have you back at a later date, maybe when your book comes out. Yeah, anytime. I'd love to help you promote your work. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Guy. All right. Wait, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? Twitter. Twitter. Okay. I took a social media break except for Twitter, and it's just Greg Elsasser, at Greg Elsasser. And my last name is spelled E-L-S-A-S-S-E-R. All right. Not Gregory Elsasser, but Greg. No, it's just under Greg. You only allowed to have a certain amount of characters on a Twitter okay. name. I'm <laughs> okay. We'll have that linked up here at the show notes page at the trauma therapist podcast.com. All right, sir. Awesome having you on here. Take care. Thank you. You have a good day. Bye-bye.